Hey Ponima. Hey Callum. Hey Floor. Hey. Hi. How are you doing? Good to meet you. I am well. Fantastic. We, we were just saying how we're really excited about your talk on Blazer and how, uh, if you'll pardon the pun, you, you are a trailblazer on a lot of the uh, of Umbraco topics. You've, you spoke about Hardcore first, you spoke about V8 a lot, and now you're talking about Blazer as well. Um, this is going to be exciting. Yes, uh, it is an exciting technology, I think, not only for me, but to the entire Microsoft.NET community as such, uh, because um, every .NET meetup uh, that you can potentially look up at, there's a talk on Blazor. Um, so I think it's it's time, it's high time that we speak about Blazor, especially now that uh, we have the WebAssembly uh, as well as Blazor server released into production. And I see a bright future for Blazor as well going ahead. So yeah, I'm super excited. Um, super nervous as well, <laughs> uh, don't but be, I'll see fine. what I can do. We're, we're friendly here. We exactly. don't bite. No need for that. Yeah, there's no need to worry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we, we just had a we just had a really nice introduction to Blazor and accessibility and some cool applications mm -hmm. of it. So I'm really excited to see what you can share whenever you're ready. Yeah, sure. Let me share my screen. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, I'm yes we can. Start. Great stuff. So today I'm going to be talking about components in Blazor. Uh, it's not a cohesive application that I've put together by any means. Uh, it's just a collection of things. You'll have a collection of demos from me, uh, but I think this will give you a good basic on basic understanding on what components are in Blazor. A little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Purnima Nair. I'm a freelance developer based in Langley, UK. I'm an Umbraco MVP and also a core collaborators team member. Uh, outside work, I spend a lot of time reading, mostly fiction, uh, and I'm a student too, learning Carnatic stream of Indian classical music for the past three years. And that's my Twitter handle, should you wish to connect with me. Before we dive into components in Blazor, let's talk very briefly about Blazor. Blazor is essentially a web application framework from Microsoft. Uh, and the most exciting feature for Blazor is that you can run native C-sharp code on your browser without plugins or code transpilation. Previous attempts, it has either been made through a plugin or code transpilation, which means that the server-side code is converted to JavaScript and then run locally on your client browser. But Blazor gets rid of the need for all that. It's pure native C-sharp running on the browser. Uh, there are two hosting models, Blazor Server, which came up last year, uh, and Blazor WebAssembly, which came into production this year, earlier this year. Uh, both of them are production ready, and uh, there are Visual Studio templates to help you set up a project yourself. Uh, if you want to know more about Blazor itself, I would recommend you going through the October script uh, that I'm putting together. But let's move on to Blazor components now. Uh, Blaze, Blazor components are building blocks of Blazor apps. So everything that you see in a Blazor app is essentially a component, be it a page in your web application, a form, a reusable dialogue, all of it are components in Blazor. Uh, they are essentially files with .razor extension and they are formally called Razor components. If you are familiar with Razor syntax as such, you will uh, be familiar with a lot of what I'm going to share as well, except for the nuances which are coming into the picture with Blazor. Uh, component names must always start with a capital or an uppercase letter in Blazor. That's one of the uh, prime requirements. And if I have a component called my component.razor, I can use that in another component or call my component from other Razor component pages by using the name of the component as a HTML tag itself. So as you can see here, the my component.razor becomes an HTML tag in itself, like an HTML element. Um, you have the ability to nest components, you have the ability to share them. So if I have a component which I wrote for my Blazor server app, I can by all means reuse that in my Blazor WebAssembly app. How cool is that? And if you're extra creative with your component setup, you can even have a collection of components and then share that across your plethora of Blazor apps, which you or your, your organization authors. Being a web application framework, of course, we accept some routing to happen. 
Um, so let's have a look at the demo. This code is on uh, GitHub repo. It's, it's a public repo, so you can have a look at it later on. I'll share the links in my slides, uh, but I'm assuming that you can um, see my screen quite clearly. Just let me know if you can't. Uh, what I have done is put together a little demo. That's my main web project or the Blazor app. Uh, I have extended the Visual Studio template uh, by adding more components myself. So in the template, the pages folder contains the main pages for my web application. So if I look at index.razor, for example, it's got a page directive. Similarly, some of them have a page directive like so. What happens is when this project compiles, um, these components are made into a C-sharp class, a partial class of the same name as the Razor component itself. In this case, it would be code partial class .cs, and a route attribute is attached to that class. And the route attribute also has a route template, which is the template that I'm specified here. So I can then access this page using this particular URL. What happens behind the scene is the Blazor router tries to find a match for the incoming uh, URL from the user among the various route templates it's got knowledge about. And then when it finds a matching route template, the control is forwarded to that. So let's have a look at this very briefly. So I have hard coded the links here. So that's the index page. If I try and access it via um, the code directive demo, that's here. If I uh, want to access the other page, which I just showed you, which is code partial class. That's here for you. So it has found the route uh, match in the route template and it routes me to that particular URL. <clears throat> c -sharp code in components, um, of course, uh, this is the most exciting feature. You can have c -sharp code running in your browser, and there are multiple ways to incorporate c -sharp code in your Razor components. I'll show you two ways to do it. There's a third way, but I'll let you read on that via the documentation links that I share. The first way I want to talk about is through a code director, which is here. The code directive essentially lets um, you add C sharp code into your Razor component. It's a code block, and inside that code block, you can have fields, you can have methods. Normally, anything that you would put in a normal C sharp class can go in there. Um, and in my Razor view, I think you all must be pretty familiar to this if you have done some MVC work in the past. I'm trying to access the field by using the at the rate field name syntax. Um, and I've wired up this method to be an event handler. We'll talk about event handling soon, but just keep this in mind that this is an event handler attached to the button for now. Now, the same thing, the same con uh, Razor component can be converted in or presented in another way in your solution, which is by breaking down the Razor part into a file, a Razor file of its own, and having the C-sharp class as a partial class. So let's look at the, C uh, the HTML code first. I have copied the entire HTML code into a Razor file here, the same exact code. And the C-sharp code that you see here, I've moved it into a partial class. The partial class has the same name as my component code partial class uh, to which I am trying to attach my C-sharp partial class. Um, so what happens behind the scene is the Razor components are always compiled as partial classes behind the scene and they take the name of the same they take the same name as the razor component so that's a huge, that's a really good feature or uh, point to take to for us to take advantage of and tailor the behavior of the component so as you can see it's the same exact code that i have got here in the c sharp partial class and if we have a look at how this pans out on the front end Let's let's go to the code directive demo first. I'm clicking the button. The counter gets incremented and I can see the code partial class is the same functionality. Absolutely no change. All what you could see is the difference in the text as I move through the functionality remains the same. It's not about um, how you do it. It's about how you want to present the code in your solution essentially. 
the next thing I want to talk about is parameters. Components are useless with para without parameters because it's, it's a web application framework and we need to have some kind of facility to pass data in and data out and parameters can help massively for that. Components can take two types of parameters. They can accept route parameters. They can accept component parameters as well. Let's take a look at the route parameters first. The first, uh, sorry, I lost the control of mouse for a minute. Put together a demo here again. It's a Razor component page, and I've specified many, many route templates, as you can see here. Uh, the first one is plain without any route, uh, route parameters. It is just a route template. But if you look at the other three, I've got some special text in there in curly braces. So when Blazor or uh, Blazor encounters such Razor, uh, sorry, not Razor, route templates with a value specified in curly braces, it knows that that is supposed to be a route parameter. And my component can make use of that route parameter in the code. How? we add a public property of the same name as the route parameter. So in this case, it would be value or it would be other value, both of which I have specified as public properties. The property being public is very important. You cannot go ahead without it being a public property. And I also need to add a parameter attribute to the property to make Blazor aware that what you see here as the property actually is a parameter and it should look at specific points, say route template or even component parameters to get its value. In this case, it's pretty clear where it should look up at. Uh, it should look up at the route parameter. And what my razor is trying to do is um, I am trying to access the uh, property value using at the rate syntax again. So let's have a quick look of this demo on the front end website. <clears throat> Sorry, just looking at the chat, uh, seeing whether it's for me. So I have hard coded a value. This is a route parameter into my nav link here. So that's getting alerted here. Uh, if I change this to hello slash world, it will take up or map the hello to help the first parameter value and world to the second route, route parameter here. I can change it further if I say uh, hello Purnima slash hello. In this instance, this value is mapped to the value route parameter and the second part is left alone because I already have a specific route template suggest uh, specified like so where the first or the what comes after my main URL, which is parameters, is a route parameter. And what follows after that, if it's a hello, it actually matches to this route template. Uh, there are other, uh, there's an, another kind of parameter called component parameter. Uh, I have a demo for that too. I've got a shared component called display text here. Let's completely forget about this part for the time being. Just pretend that that doesn't exist. What I'm trying to um, do here is if I have a value for text, I'm trying to show that text value here. Again, as you can see, I've got a public property here with uh, a parameter attribute. In this instance, Blazor knows that it is again supposed to be a parameter, but I can access or I can give it values like so. Um, as I said before in one of my previous slides, the name of the component becomes the name of the HTML tag, which is exactly what has happened here. But the parameter that I have here, the property, becomes an HTML attribute which is available on my component here. And I can give it any value as I please. It would map, match it up and showcase the value in the front end. So if I'm going to show this on the front end, here is how you have it. This is a component parameter, and that's what exactly I have passed through from here. Moving on, the life cycle of a component. Um, so there are several methods that are available for you to tailor the behavior of a component. We'll go through each of them uh, very briefly. Uh, the first one is the set parameters async, which runs before the parameters for the component are set. 
Um, so this method tries to match up the incoming parameters and the parameters specified for the component and match up the value and assign the values. Uh, the signature of the method looks like so. I've got a little component here again, which I put together. Set parameters as sync accepts a parameter view object, which is nothing but a collection of parameters and their values. And what the base or the default implementation of this method does is when an incoming stream of parameters is found, uh, the component tries to find a match between the parameters specified on it with the parameter value collection and assigns values to whichever parameter there is a value incoming in the parameter view object. Let me take it uh, a step further and make it more clear. In my component, I've got three parameters, first name, last name and job title. I'm calling my lifecycle methods parameter from my component lifecycle raise a component page here. Note that I am only passing in parameters values for first name and last name, not for the job title. So if I go and have a look at the front end, as you can see in the set parameters async, the first name is getting bound and then the last name is getting bound. There is no value getting bound to the job title because I haven't specified anything for the job title as a parameter value that I am doing specifically in the code itself, as I have shown here. And then again, I'm trying to write into the console. Uh, it's important to call the set parameters to sync on the base. Otherwise, there is every possibility that Blazor has a mind of its own and then tries not to set the parameters. So that's about set parameters to sync. It runs every time the component renders and then it tries to set up the parameter values. The next method is on initialized, which has got both a synchronous and non asynchronous uh, and asynchronous version. Uh, this method runs on every first render of the component. Note that point because it's extremely important. And this runs uh, soon after the set parameters async is run. Uh, especially in Blazor uh, server apps, this method is called twice. The reason being Blazor server apps work slightly differently from the Blazor WebAssembly model where the components are pre-rendered, then the signal art connection is established, and then uh, we have the components actually rendered out. So this method is called twice in Blazor server apps. Um, if you have any data coming in from an external data source or any data that you want to showcase in your component, that should be initialized in this method. The third one is on parameter set, which again has a synchronous and an asynchronous version. This method runs after the on initialized. Uh, if it is a first render and thereafter it, it this method runs every time when parameter values changes. Uh, the signature for both these lifecycle methods are pretty simple and straightforward. It's a simple override of the method. It doesn't take any arguments up. All you need to do is call the base uh, on parameters async on, on parameters async again so that it can actually set the values for you. The last of the lifecycle method which I want to discuss is on after render. Again, a synchronous and asynchronous version. This method runs after the component has rendered completely. So if you look, if you saw Denny's uh, presentation before mine, he he should have shown you all about refs and calling JavaScript code from .NET uh, C sharp code in Blazor. So that all those calls should happen in this method, which is on after render async. The reason being, this is the point at which the reference to the references to the HTML elements or references to the child components are available. So if you want to try and run some JavaScript code, especially that needs to run happen at on after render uh, method. The signature of the method is like so. Uh, it's an override again and it accepts a Boolean first render. The Boolean first render, as the help says, it's set to true if it's the first render of the component and thereafter it is set to false. So you can check that, especially in Blazor server apps, to make sure that your component is completely rendered before you actually start calling a JavaScript code from your method or even use child component references in your code. 
data binding, of course, web application framework again, and mini data binding. Uh, let's talk about one way data binding in Blazor, uh, which I've been showcasing so far. Uh, this is unidirectional flow of updates, which means I as a user cannot update the data directly. It has to be done by the application. Uh, even if the data is getting updated as a result of a button click, it is still the application doing it for me, not me doing it by myself. A good example of this would be displaying the value of a parameter as a label, as I have shown you in all my demos so far. Uh, but here is an example. Again, if you missed that out, one-way data binding, I have the counter here again. Uh, I have a private field and a button click event which increments the counter value for me. And I am using one-way data binding or I'm or I'm invoking one-way data binding by using at the rate the name of the field or the property syntax here. There's also two-way data binding, which is for Bla what Blazor is well known for being a web application framework. This means bi-directional flow of updates. I as a user can update the data as much as the web application can do it for me. And a classic example of how we can do it or achieve this is using the bind, uh, the bind attribute that Blazor ships along with. Uh, the bind attribute is an attribute which you place on an HTML element, any HTML element possibly, and it can bind to the value of a C sharp field or your class property name, or even an expression value. And the bind attribute is smart enough as well to understand which type of HTML element it is bound to, whether it's an input type of text or an input type of checkbox. And based upon that knowledge, it can bind the value of the field or the property to a particular HTML attribute like value. So if it is um, an input type of text that I'm trying to bind to, the bind attribute knows that whatever the field or property must be, it should bind to the value attribute of the HTML element. If it's a checkbox, it should bind to the checked attribute of the input element. Uh, by default, the data binding or two-way data binding happens when, uh, when the user focuses out of the input field, but you can even fine tune and control that by using a bind value event attribute. In this case, what I'm suggesting is that um, you would normally use this format with the bind value property name or a bind property name. In this instance, what I'm telling Blazor is that I want to bind the property name to the value field of this particular input element, but let that data binding happen on this particular own event. So for example, in an input type of text, the data binding we normally would happen on on change, but I can say let it happen on on input, at which point the data binding would continuously happen for every input that I make to the keyboard. So for a demo, I have again two little components of little tiny forms which are set up here. The first one is an input type of text which binds to the first name field here, uh, and I'm trying to show the value here for the two way binding upon a different event in itself. I am binding on the first name key press field here, and I'm telling Blazor to bind this value to this particular field upon input. So which means with every keystroke that I make, this value which I'm binding to uh, as one way binding to show the data, this keeps on updating. So let's have a quick look at that too. As you can see, the data is not getting shown here because it's not bound yet. But once I focus out, hey, the data is bound and then I can make the I can see the value. I have to still focus in and start typing and then focus out for which the data has to be bind again, uh, bound again. But with the second field where I'm binding on the input, as you can see, it is getting continuously updated. I can just uh, type on and on and it would get bound. If you have done AngularJS or Vue.js apps, this, this kind of data binding must be really familiar to you because you, can, you would have seen that in action there. 
Um, I'm going to quickly go through event handling. Uh, event handling can be specified on HTML elements as attributes of on event. Um, so for an event on click, handle on click method would be uh, event handler. Event handler can be asynchronous uh, and can return a task. You can even pass in an event args uh, to, under to understand more about what event has happened, whether a particular key has been pressed, etc. Um, there's, there's also communication between components that has uh, that can happen. There's cascading values. If you want to cascade a value from a parent component over multiple layers and then to a through to a nested child component. Uh, I'm not going to go through the demo because of time constraints, but I do have samples of this in the repo. There's also two way component binding through which parent to child or child to parent communication can happen. Again, there is a demo for this. Uh, accessing the JavaScript runtime, uh, I believe Danny has gone through this, but to show you a quick little demo of all this. Component comes. I have a parent counter and child counter here. I can click the parent counter and because the child counters are bound, the values get constantly updated. I can update the parent counter values from my child counter as well. And to show you a quick demo of what happens um, when I try to alert something on screen. That's the demo here. Everything is there in my GitHub repo, uh, which I have put together the link for. Uh, resources mainly are the Microsoft official docs. I hope that, that was a quick presentation about uh, components and I have gathered some basic information. Thank you. Well, as you might have noticed, uh, I've replaced Callum. Callum is currently pre uh, preparing his Umbra coffee uh, talk in the other room, so I took his place for the Q&A. Uh, we have to keep it a little bit short because we're all already over time into the next talk. Uh, but there are basically two very important questions, uh, and mostly uh, most of them are uh, what you feel would be appropriate. In this case, what kind of future do you see for this in the Umbraco ecosystem? Like, is there a future for Blazor in Umbraco? Um, I see this as, um, okay, I wouldn't see it as something right as, but this happens. We can't hear you that well, Purnima. Maybe you, we you're can. You're cutting out a little. Exactly. Oh, okay. Oh, the, uh, that was better. You're back <laughs> again. Okay. So let's, tr let's try again yeah. with that answer. Sure. Uh, so what I see happening in the Umbraco ecosystem around Blazor is uh, integrations to hardcore or even yeah. the CMS as such, because you can expose the CMS content as an endpoint and Blazor can consume that. Um, of course, we have hardcore with a wide variety of data like GraphQL, um, even the native API that comes out of hardcore. So I, I see a lot of integrations happening with Blazor. Uh, it can be a really smooth path, uh, especially to someone like me who's a server side developer uh, and picking up a framework like Vue.js or AngularJS, a really steep curve for me. Um, so yeah, my first choice in that instance would be Blazor. And of course, it's exciting as well, as I spoke to you before. Yeah, no, well, well, thank you. Uh, in this case, there are a few more questions. In this case, I would recommend you to join the chat of the, on the DF20.nl website so you can actually help people out there. Absolutely. Uh, onto them. Questions thank and compliments. And like compliments, yeah, loads of compliments, and those so. as well, obviously. <laughs> so uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your very interesting talk. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to keep looking at it back for a few more times at least. Yeah. Thank so, you thank very you. much. Thank you for having me on board. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you.